Gravity is not the only force, a pseudo force, that we deal with in our universe. Using crude water clocks, the time balls rolling down inclined planes, Galileo searched for and found a description of how bodies fall. His law of falling bodies, however, wasn't a fundamental law of nature. Within half a century, it was superseded by a deeper insight into nature, univer Newton's universal law of gravity. Through the genius of Newton, the force of gravity was revealed as a fundamental force of nature. Inspired by Newton, physicists in the 18th century sought to identify, classify, and mathematically describe the numerous forces observed in nature. Knowledge of these forces provided physics with a certain predictive power, because according to Newton's second law, F equals ma, forces shape the motion of all things. Through painstaking experiments, these physicists reached empirical descriptions of forces in the world about them. Tensions, spring forces, friction, viscosity, electricity, magnetism, and chemical action. As the number of forces grew, so did the applications in an increasing industrialized world. Yet a question which confronted these physicists was, are all these forces fundamental, or can they reduce, be reduced to more basic forces? Not until the 18th century did a second force emerge as fundamental, the electric force. The French engineer Charles Augustin Coulomb assumed that analogous to the gravitational force between two masses, the electric force between two charges is proportional to the product of the charges. Experimentally, he found that the electric force is similar to gravity in another way. The force between two charges de decreases as the square of the distance between them. Summarized mathematically, the electric force F between two charges Q1 and Q2, which are separated by distance R, is known as Coulomb's law and is written as F equals K sub E times Q1 Q2 over R squared times the unit vector R. Just as G is a universal constant for gravity, K sub E is a universal constant for electricity. Magnetism is also identified as a fundamental force of nature. The attraction or repulsion between two magnets could be described by a force between pairs of magnetic poles. The progress of physics appeared to be a triumph of Newtonian mechanics. The forces of nature were successively reduced to attractions or repulsions between particles. The first 40 years of the 19th century, however, saw a growing reaction against such a division of phenomena in favor of some kind of correlation of forces. The turn inward to unification of forces was spearheaded by Orsted, Amper, and Faraday. By the middle of the century, they had succeeded in unifying two hitherto disparate forces, electricity and magnetism, into one, electromagnetism. The process was crowned in the theory of James Clerk Maxwell, who expressed the unification by a set of equations which interlate electric and magnetic phenomena. Soon, tensions, spring forces, friction and viscosity, chemical actions, and even light were recognized as arising fundamentally from the electromagnetic force. Based on Maxwell's success, the search for a common mathematical description or unification of forces had begun. With the 20th century came the discovery of radioactivity. The probing of atoms and the subsequent realization that more than just gravity and electromagnetism would be needed to explain this new world. Both a new dynamics, the law of quantum mechanics, which supersede Newton's laws on atomic and subatomic distance scales, and new forces were needed. Because Newton's laws do not apply on the distance scales at which the new forces act, we shall not pursue the study of these forces further. Nevertheless, many theses, such as the quest for the fundamental constituents of matter and the fundamental forces of nature, carry over from classical, classical mechanics, and it's interesting to survey briefly what has been found. Experiments probing atoms reveal that inside an atom there is a compact center, the nucleus, composed of positively charged protons and neutral neutrons. Neg negatively charged electrons orbit the nucleus, held by the electric force from the protons. The natural question which arose is, what holds the nucleus together? Physicists realized that neither gravity nor electromagnetism held the compact nucleus together, but that a new force was at work. Aptly named the strong force, it overcomes the electric repulsion between protons and holds the nucleus together. Unlike gravity and electricity, the strong force does not extend to great distances. It has a very limited range, the size of a nucleus. 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Outside this range, the strong force has virtually no effect. If it, if it did, we wouldn't be here. Matter would collapse into dense lumps of subatomic particles. Natural radioactivity could not be explained in all instances by any of the known forces, strong, electromagnetic, or gravitational. 
Another force is implicated in the day decay of the nuclei, the weak force. This force is intrinsically weaker than the strong force and has an even more limited range, about 10 to the minus 16th centimeter, or 1 1,000th the size of the nucleus. Because of its severely limited range, its most common manifestations in nuclei are feeble indeed, about 10 to the 6th times weaker than the strong force. Nevertheless, the weak force plays an essential role in the re release of nuclear energy in stars' nuclear power plants and in causing some stars ultimately to explode. The behavior of the four fundamental forces of nature, strong, electromagnetic, weak, and gravitational, is reasonably well understood, but nobody knows why there should be four of them. Albert Einstein spent the last 20 years of his life unsuccessfully searching for a way to unify two of the forces, gravity and electromagnetism. 20th century physics has become a story of attempting to explain all the complexities of physics as aspects of similar systems, a search for unification of, of the fundamental forces. The water clocks and inclined planes of Galileo have been replace, replaced by increasingly larger, more energetic particle accelerators. Unified theories are emerging that bring together the weak and electromagnetic forces, as well as more comprehensive theories that attempt to give a coherent account of how all these forces have evolved from simpler, simpler laws in the infancy of the universe. The early universe may be the only experimental test for such theories. It may be the great ocean of truth that still lies undiscovered before us. Here's a table of the four fundamental forces in order of strength. Gravity, by far, is the weakest, followed by the weak force, the electromagnetic force, then the strong force. Electromagnetism and gravitation dominate, however, because of their far-reaching range. If you were to hold a magnet over a piece of iron metal and then move the magnet closer, eventually the iron metal will fly up and attach to the magnet. Think about that. The Earth's gravity is generated by its mass, which is 5.97219 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. When the iron metal flies up and attaches to the magnet, the electromagnetic forces overcome the force of gravity generated by this massive Earth sphere. That tells you something about how weak the gravitational force is. Gravity dominates the universe because of how much matter, matter there is in the universe. Electromagnetism when there are charged particles. Most of the matter in the universe is nucle neutrally charged. When it isn't, things tend to neutralize, which is what is happening with lightning. Let's talk about the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Let's take the geocentric perspective. The relative motion of the Sun is counterclockwise. We're from the northern hemisphere. From the south, it would be clockwise. The vernal e equinox, is 21 March. It marks the beginning of the spring in the north and the fall in the south. The days and nights are both 12, 12 hours long on this day. Spring in the north or fall in the south last 92 days, 18 hours and 0 minutes. Next comes the summer solstice on 21 June. In the north, this is the longest day of the year. In the south, this is the shortest day. It marks the beginning of summer in the north and winter in the south. It's 93 days 15 hours and 36 minutes long. Notice that summer is longer than spring. Next is the autumnal equinox. It's on 23 September. Here, like the vernal equinox, the day is the same length as the night. It marks the beginning of the fall in the north and the spring in the south. Notice that fall in the north is much shorter than spring and summer. 89 days, 20 hours and 38 minutes. Next is winter solstice. It's on 21 December. It marks the beginning of winter in the north and summer in the south. It's 88 days, 23 hours, and 43, 46 minutes long. We're lucky in the north, short winters and long summers. We're going to exaggerate the eccentricity so this is clear. The sun appears at one focus. Here's the point of perihelion. In 2014, it occurred on 4 January. I include the year because the date changes year to year. Here's the distance. Here's the aphelion point. In 2014, it occurred on 4th of July. Here's the distance. Now we can lay in the seasons. Summer solstice is on 21 June. Remember, that's when the sun shines longest in the north and shortest in the south. That's about 12 and a half days prior to the aphelion point. Note that the Earth at the summer solstice is 12 and a half days from aphelion, 
when it's furthest away from the sun. It's ironic that in the north during our hot season, the sun is farthest away. We'll go counterclockwise from here. Here's the autumnal equinox. That's the time of year when the day and night are 12 hours everywhere. This period of time is summer in the north and winter in the south. It's about 93 and a half days long. Here's the winter solstice. It's about 13 days before perihelion. This period of time is fall in the north and spring in the south. It's almost 90 days long. Why the difference in time? It's because of Kepler's second law. When the earth is at aphelion, it travels farther and moves slower. In the north, you get 93 and a half days of summer and almost 90 days of fall. Here's the vernal equinox. This period of time is winter in the north and summer in the south. It's almost 89 days long. This period of time is spring in the north and fall in the south. It's almost 93 days long. Because of something called the apsidal precession of the Earth's argument of periapsis, the Earth's argument of periapsis slowly increases. This means it rotates counterclockwise. It takes over 134,000 years for the ellipse to revolve once relative to the fixed stars. We talked about how the Earth's polar axis and hence the solstices and equinox process, and it processes with a period of about 25,771.4 years in relation to the fixed stars. With these two forms of precession, it takes about 21,600 years for the ellipse to revolve once, for the perihelion to return to the same date, given a calendar that tracks seasons perfectly. The artifact of an elliptical orbit is the uh, a variation in the true length of the, of the day. The Earth orbits the Sun once a year. In fact, that's how we define the length of a year. At the same time, the Earth is rotating. The Earth rotates once per day. In fact, that's how we define the length of the day. If we count the number of Earth rotations in a year, we come up with 365.25636, or about 365 and a quarter days. The Earth's rotation and the Earth's orbit around the Sun are not synchronized. We use a Gregorian calendar. Others use Islamic, Hindu, or Hebrew calendars. The Gregorian calendar has 365 days in a year. Every four years is a leap year when an extra day, 29 February, is added. That accounts for the extra quarter day each year. You'll notice that the number of rotations is not 365 and a quarter exactly. One leap year every four years doesn't work. In the Gregorian calendar, every year that's divisible by four is a leap year, except for years that are divisible by 100. Those aren't leap years. Sen Centurial years that are divisible by 400 are also leap years. <laughs> we measure a day from midnight to midnight or noon to noon. The red line is midnight. The green is noon. Relative to the sun, the Earth makes a full revolution because of its orbital motion. This is an inertial rotation. You see from this animation that relative to the stellar background, there's no Earth rotation going on. If you were on the sun, however, you'd see all parts of the Earth throughout the year. On the left-hand side, the midnight side is at noon and vice versa. On the right-hand side, the noon side is at noon and the midnight side is at midnight. Here's what a solar day looks like. The green light segment starts at noon and ends at noon. Likewise, the red line segment starts at midnight and ends at midnight. There are 365.25636 of these kinds of rotations in a year. Here's the single rotation in inertial space. There are two motions going on here, the Earth's rotation and the Earth's orbital motion. Both are in the counterclockwise direction. You'll notice after one complete rotation, either 2 pi radians or 360 degrees, the green line segment that started at noon is no longer pointing at the sun. The 24-hour period that we've referred to a day, as a day is more accurately called a solar day. A, 360 degree or 2 pi radian rotation takes less time. 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.0916 seconds. Here are both. You won't see the difference until the animation finishes. Notice that in 24 hours, the Earth rotates more and travels along its orbit more. In these animations, I've used the circular orbit for the Earth. Earth's orbit is not circular. Let's say the Earth were orbiting at this point. Now 
Now, let's make the orbit elliptical. This is an exaggeration. Earth orbit is nearly circular. I've exaggerated the eccentricity to make this point clearer. Here, one solar day occurs just as it did on the previous slide with a circular orbit. This occurs in Earth orbit around 10 March and 1 November every year. What if the Earth were at perihelion? Because the orbital motion is faster, the green noon line does not line up with the sun vector. Likewise, the Earth moves slower at aphelion. The green noon line here also does not line up with the sun vector. On the left is a plot of the angle swept out by the Earth during various times of its orbit. The highest angles are at perihelion. The lowest angles are at aphelion. The dotted line is the mean or average angle swept out, 0.986 degrees. That's also the amount of rotation beyond 360 degrees for a solar day. Because the Earth travels faster at perihelion and slower at aphelion, the solar day, as you report on a sundial, is shorter at times and longer at times. The variation can be up to 20 seconds. The variations are additive day to day. Successive days and then su successive days are sh shorter and then successive days are longer. The, the graph on the right shows the variation between sundial time and clock time. The variation over the year ranges from 16 minutes ahead to 15 minutes behind. So a sundial is not a very good way to keep track of time. That's the end of the course. I hope you enjoyed this. This gave you a taste of orbital dynamics. If you're interested, there's a longer course that delves into much more detail with detailed mathematical derivations.